So should we do uh, a, a mini course on, on suggestion, false memory? Um, let's see. So there's a, like a 20 page version of this on our website, on the Casey Lehman website. And there's like a 150 page version in my, that will someday maybe be a book. And this will be the, and this will be the 12 minute version or the 18 minute version or something. So I'll see if I can. All right. Um, so several, when you, when you talk about the whole kind of the large arena, the large field, the large issue of like suggestion, suggestibility, um, guided imagery, false memory. Uh, there are several pieces I think are important. And one is um, like suggestion. Well, it will kind of increase trouble with counterfeit Jesus. You know, if you're if you're if you're suggestive, if you're suggesting, um, you can you can kind of increase the risk of the person imagining stuff, making stuff up on their own. And that's a concern that people raise, and it's actually an important concern to address, which we will touch on that. And then there's a question about um, yeah, suggestion. Actually, um, this one is a. Um, There's a risk of actual false memory of, of, of either creating um, the perception of an event that actually didn't happen, which causes all kinds of trouble, or maybe false memory or distorted memory. And then there's a piece of it's really, really important to not um, dismiss recovered memory, which is kind of a whole. So I'm going to see whether I can fly over this large field in a few minutes here. And again, again, the there's already on the on the website, Kate's landing website, like a 20 page decent version with a lot of footnotes and stuff, and eventually a bigger one. Okay, so. That's the large picture, and then I'll you know, put together a bunch of pieces to see if we can get that done. All right. Um, so a, a piece, a piece of this picture is just kind of the way memory works. Uh, and that um, everybody kind of intuitively knows that memory is fallible. We forget things, and that frequently, if you've sort of forgotten something, if somebody reminds you, they can kind of they can. Uh, they can activate your memory. They can like, oh, Carl, did you remember you had a dentist appointment today? Oh my goodness! I, yes, you're right. I did. I totally forgot. That's kind of simple. And then it's you know the uh, more complicated version of that is somebody says, oh, do you remember so and so? No, I don't at all. Do you remember that trip? Do you remember that person? And at first you you have not a, not a hint of a memory, but if they give you a bunch of reminders, oh, remember it was it was two years ago. We were in Montana. We after we visited the Bergerons, we went to this. We went there. And you know he was really tall, and she was wearing a pink hat, and they had a dog, and you know, and you fell in their swimming pool after. Oh, right, and you know, and as you start giving them, a, if you give them more reminders, you were both there together. They initially don't remember it, and as you give them more reminders, eventually it'll, you'll, you'll, you're poking around in the part of their brain where that memory is is stored, or at least the link is stored. And when you, if you poke around enough, eventually you'll light up that network, and they're like, oh yes, the memory comes back to them. And there's actually fascinating research. Um, like it's footnoted and described in more detail in that essay on the website. But one of the kind of earliest classic uh, studies is a guy, like for four years, every day, he described some event in his life in detail in his journal. And then at the end of those four years, he went back and tested himself, like, you know, so what can, can, what can I remember? And like, it would be just like a little significant, like, you know, pizza at, at um, Eduardo's in Chicago, you know, and it's the 4th of July, or, um, you know, birthday present, from Aunt May, or some some little just little teeny reminder, and kind of tested himself. What can you remember? And of course, there's some things he could just remember off the top of his head, but there's a huge pile. This is every day for four years, and what he discovered is, as he went through and and for each event he had recorded a whole bunch of details, and as he would add more and more of the details, more and more of the memories would come back. So you know, okay, so 
you know, what did I do on the 4th of July three years ago? Uh, first, no memory. Um, I was in Georgia with friends. Mm, I was in Georgia with these particular friends. I was in Georgia with these particular friends visiting my brother-in-law and we went swimming in a pond. And as he would look, add more and more of the pieces, you know, more and more of the memories, he'd be like, oh yes, now I remember. And as he added all the details, he got them almost all back. And there's a handful that he couldn't, that he didn't get back. And for those, if he actually talked to the people who'd been there, eventually, like with enough prompts, with enough reminders, he was able to get back pretty much every memory he recorded. But just a, a real simple summary that the average layperson could kind of, oh yeah, right, that is the way memory works. So, um, if you're a therapist and you have a person who, um, there's all kinds of clues that indicate, oh, you know, they have the whole picture of pre post-traumatic stress disorder. There's all kinds of clues that even make you think about what kind of, you know, oh, it, it sure looks like the picture of emotional and physical abuse of a primary care provider, or this, 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 all the symptoms, all the reactions, all the triggers look like somebody who's been sexually abused. You're the therapist and you kind of guess, you see a bunch of clues and you think, I, I, I'm pretty sure I know what's in there. But the person says, I have no memory. And it's hard to do you know, memory healing work if you don't have any memories yet. And so, uh, if you uh, if you poke around in there, which you know one way, if you have a, a, a tried and true method that is actually, you know, if you talk to their family members, if you and there's ways of getting more information. Well, let's look at the medical records. Oh well, here when you were nine years old, you know your mom took you in three times to the doctor, and there you had trauma. And here are the pictures. Of, and like there's there's ways to find other evidence that could poke, prompt those memories. Somebody else in the family, oh, well, you have five sisters and they all remember being molested by somebody in your family. And, and there's a lot of information. They don't have to say anything about you, but they just can share their experiences and that will fill in lots of the holes or, or other examples like that. There's, there's ways you can uh, carefully help to prompt to, to um, fill in pieces that you do know, like the medical records, like, you know, things that other family members or somebody else might know about that are in that context. And sure enough, the person will often be able to find memories that had been there. And then once they come forward, you can document, oh, sure enough, look at all this evidence. That's exactly what happened. So a lot of those techniques therapists over the years have discovered as they're trying to help people work with traumatic memories that have been lost or that they, you know, they disassociated or repressed or for some reason they can't find them. And so as thousands of people, this is especially like in the 80s and 90s or we're doing trauma uh, healing for trauma, uh, traumatic memories. A technique that also works some of the well, it, it does work. Is if you're you see all the clues, and you guess what you think might be there, and if you have the person imagine. So I I think I look at the clues and I think your alcoholic uncle probably molested you when you were visiting when you stayed with them with he and his wife for the summer when you were eight years old. So if I coach you to imagine, well, picture yourself. Picture, so what bedroom were you sleeping in? Picture the bedroom, picture yourself. What pajamas did you wear? Picture yourself going to bed in your bedroom, blah, blah, blah. Picture your uncle coming in a little bit drunk and you can imagine, you know, if you coach them to imagine the whole scenario, if it actually happened, I mean, if, that, if you're guessing correctly and you use that kind of imagination tool to kind of guess at the memory details that are in there and in that imagination process, you fill in enough of the details you can actually, kind of like in the Star Wars movies or the space, science fiction, the, the image of the, the, the person you're flying after, you know, pew, 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 and the, the image on your screen, and then they go, ding, 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 and then you, choo, 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 right? So if you get them all locked together, it like, you know, the memory circuits activate, and the person says, oh my goodness, and now I remember. Okay, well, that does work, but other research, and like each of these pieces, there's, the, the 175 page version, every one of these little points would have like 15 pages of like three examples and the footnotes and the research and all. So uh, the reason people did use that tool is because it does work some of the time. And you can use that tool and the person will find memories and then all the, then, and there's lots of evidence that you can find after they recover it. You can say, oh, and look, well, say, oh my goodness, you say he went to the doctor. What was his name? You call that doctor, you go find his record and sure enough, there it is. You've, you've got photographs, you've got, you know, STD tests coming back, there's all kinds of evidence to, to verify it, which is, in those cases, nobody's fussing. But there is other research about suggestibility and suggestion such as this. 
um, fascinating study. Some, um, I can't remember, it's Sweden or it's one of those Norse countries. And uh, a plane flew into a building, a great big disaster. And it was, I can't remember, a year after, sometime after, the, after this huge big disaster, the psychology department did this fun little memory research study. They asked a bunch of their colleagues, you know, uh, do you remember or what do you remember about the, te the television footage of the plane flying into the building? And practically every person they asked gave a detailed description of their memory of watching the television footage of the plane flying into the building and like you know, what was the angle and how fast it was going and was it on fire. And I mean, they, they described all these details of, of like, yeah, this is, I, yes, I remember the television footage and this is what it was all, this, this is what, what I remember. The only hitch was there wasn't any television footage. There had been, I mean, it wasn't like the Twin Towers where there was two planes, and by the time the second one came, there was cameras. Like, nobody was on the scenes thinking, oh, I wonder if a plane's going to go into this building in, in the next five seconds. There was no television footage. There was newspaper reporting, and when the people had read the accounts, as happens, like when you read The Lord of the Rings, you read, some, you read a storybook, and as you're reading it, what do you do? You're picturing, you know, as you're imagining, oh, well, I can picture Gandalf, and I, you know, you're, or Narnia, or whatever, you're reading the line that which in the wardrobe, you're reading the story, you're like, oh, and, I, and then you can kind of picture us on the big line, and you, you, make, you generate images in your mind when you read a story. Same way you read a news report about a plane flying into a building, and just automatically, spontaneously, your mind generates imagery. And if it's that kind of a deal and it's in the news in a bunch of places and there are people talking about it and you remember what you talk about it with your friends and every time you talk about it you're kind of picturing what it must have looked like and a year later you forget that all those images uh, you read the written account you generate the images yourself and there was no television footage and it just it's a real clear classic dramatic demonstration of how your brain can slip and there you know, there really was a plane accident um, but all the, Im all the image details the people thought they remembered and were very, con very uh, adamant, very convinced. You know, they they uh, were convinced that they had these clear visual memories of the television footage had all been fabricated. They all been fabricated, their, well, generated by their minds, reading the information in the newspaper, and they had totally misremembered whether they actually saw any television footage that didn't exist. So there's an interesting example. And another example, which is a real classic, um, a place where it's especially uh, risky is this kind of research where, so the whole family's in on this deal, where they generate some like, uh, like, um, don't you remember when, uh, so there, your aunt really did get married when you were eight years old, but they said, oh, you know, don't you remember the time when, when you were eight and Aunt Susan got married and you spilled the punch on her wedding dress? And initially the person says, what are you talking about? You're, that, that never happened. You're crazy. But if like three of her siblings and both of her parents all say, oh, don't you remember? And well, guess what happens? Every time they say, well, don't you remember? You know, so there you were and it was like in front of the big table and there was a cake and it was, it was just after the ceremony and they were just about to cut the cake and you were running with it. And, and so they describe all these details. And as the person's trying to think, well, did that happen? You're kind of generating imagery of all that while the person's describing it. And what they found was Many people, I can't remember what the percentage was, but it was like a great big shocking percentage. If people they knew and trusted repeatedly made the same suggestion and said, oh, well, yes, of course this happened, and, um, and described the details, and each time they would describe them, they would generate the imagery. If that happened repeatedly over time, a lot of people would become convinced. They, they generate the imagery, it would become familiar, and they would become convinced that it actually happened, and it got to the point where it felt like their other, I mean, like it felt like any other normal memory, where they had clear visual imagery, they rehearsed many times, it was quite distinct with all that other outside support and suggestion. And at the end of the study, when they said, oh, surprise, this has all been an experiment, this, this never happened, we've all been in on it, the subjects said, oh, come on, this, like, now this is a joke. I mean, many of the subjects didn't believe that it was a research study. They thought, no, now you're pulling my leg, okay, you know, enough of the jokes already, like, you know, okay, so I'm an idiot that I didn't remember it, and you had to all, you know, remind me of the details, but, like, can we drop it? Now, that's so, well, of course, in that case, no big harm done. You know, the person was convinced that they spilled punch on their, on their aunt's wedding dress, and, like, nobody goes to jail. 
But if you go to a therapy session or you're in a therapy group, and even if they're halfway right and they correctly perceive the clues, you, there's all kinds of clues indicating that you were traumatized as a child in some way. And maybe even they correctly perceive it looks like you were molested in some way. There's all kinds of clues indicating trauma as a child that in some way involves sexual abuse. If they guess wrong about the perpetrator and they in, in, in some way encourage you, they, they make suggestions, they make guesses, they make assumptions, and they're, a similar scenario occurs to this wedding dress research. What you get is a person who, after practicing for weeks or months or years, mental imagery, and they have a, a support system around them that's basically saying, yeah, this really happened, you're just in denial. They will generate this objective perception that this actually happened. And that's why there was a huge, big nightmare scenario in our culture during the 90s because even if you get one piece wrong and they convince you that your uncle molested you and he goes to jail and it was really the janitor at your grade school, that's a pretty big, those are big stakes. You destroy an entire family, which is why we teach people don't do it. Okay, so I'll come back to that. So yeah, um, yeah, memory, and that's how you can help find a memory. So another piece is, so there's a whole other side of the picture where, it's, where there are folks who argue, well, there's no such thing as recovered memory. Like, you know, um, one of the simplest pieces there, oh, interesting little data point. All the, all the authors that I've read, 100% of them, the ones that argue that there's no such thing as recovered memory, they're all lab researchers. They've had uh, all of the, of the researchers that I studied, zero actual patients. They're not, they're not clinicians. They've, not, they've never seen an actual patient. But they study memory in the, in the research lab, which, I mean, that's a legitimate thing to do. But it's an interesting data point that they, they've actually never seen a real, an actual patient. And they study in the lab, like college students who see a gory, a horror movie, which is actually a mild form of trauma, which I actually agree with, which is why, like, people don't show your children horror movies. Um, and what, what you see for mild to moderate trauma is the more intense the trauma the more vivid the memory is, the stronger the memory is, the clearer the memory is. If you have a little bitty thing, it's a mild memory, and they say, hey, people, the bigger the traumatic experience, the clearer and stronger the memory is. These people who say, like, here's a memory this size, it's this strong, here's a memory this size, and they're saying that a memory this big is, you don't get it all, that's ridiculous. They, that's, that's impo that's, and they seem to have totally missed the point that there's, there's problems of capacity, and there's a point where you're, you're, um, there's lots of other evidence that support this, that as the intensity of a traumatic experience gets higher and higher and higher, at some point, if you're totally overwhelmed, your brain does weird things, like totally disconnect or dissociate. So, um, so let's see in my real short summary, again, like the 20-page the, uh, version is more detailed, the 175 pages will be even more detailed, but there's a whole group of researchers who argue that like, the bigger the experience, the stronger the memory. If somebody claims that they had this horrible thing that happened in childhood, but they had no memory of it for 30 years, and they go to therapy, and, it, and then they, just, they discover that this horrible thing happened, like those people are all making it up. This is, a, this is a racket. Therapists are suggesting these things because they want folks to come back and pay them money, whatever. They have theories or whatever. But um, pretty, a pretty big challenge question, like um, basically, well, and, and, and an interesting data point, one of the many mentioned in the article, is actually lots of these people report memories coming back before they go to therapy. I mean, some of them, they come in therapy, but many of them, they're 23 years old and they start having nightmares. Or they're 23 years old and they have a friend who is telling, telling them about being sexually abused and all of a sudden they freak out and have flashbacks. And they, so lots of these people, um, after years of no memory, they, they describe some form of, you know, I had no memory that this happened to me for, you know, for the last 15 years and it seems to be coming back. So there's a whole bunch of people who claim that just doesn't happen, that's all made up, that's just a huge, big, outrageous fabrication, false memory. All the supposed perpetrators are innocent, all the supposed survivors are making it up. So it's a pretty big deal to not dismiss recovered memory if it's real. And so a whole big chunk of, well, this Zoom, this Zoom presentation, the essay on the website and the eventual book is there's a whole, whole, whole lot of evidence. Any honest evaluator, in my assessment, would say 
oh my goodness, I mean, God bless the poor researchers who are working on little teeny memories in the lab. They don't understand the whole phenomenon of capacity and overwhelm and what happens if you have an overwhelming memory that's too painful to deal with and you either kind of practice stuffing it down over time with repression or just totally disconnects with the association. The lab researchers are not studying. And this is, it's so strange to me that it, and it seems like there's, it's so polarized that they, they, I think some of the lab researchers are actually honest campers or not just pedophiles trying to like subvert truth. I mean, some of them are honest researchers who've never seen an actual client and who are working on small trauma. And there's such, such, there's such polarized opposite sides of the battlefield. The therapists who are actually seeing patients who are frequently describing recovered memories, they totally, dis actually many of them have never even read any of the research and realized how careful and rigorous and compelling it is. They just basically, those are enemies. They're trying to invalidate my clients and like um, they don't actually read or listen to anything they say. These people actually have never seen any clients and don't seem to really listen to what these folks say. And it, if you actually know both sides about capacity and w what happens when you overwhelm the brain and about that whole phenomenon of how, uh, there's lots of interesting data points about capacity and ha we have limits of capacity and when you exceed capacity, weird things happen. If you actually know both sides, you can have an intelligent approach to the whole thing, which is what I'm trying to accomplish. And from what I've, from my, I, uh, in the last few years, I've been focusing more on a manual, but there was a block of time for maybe five years where I read thousands and thousands and thousands of pages about this. And nowhere in all that study did I see, find any memory researcher who actually really listened to or had any experience over here. And I never saw any therapist writing about the issue who actually read any of the research. So, again, the research, like the wedding cake, um, the family, the whole thing about you, you spilled punch on your aunt's wedding dress. There's a bunch of research like that, that if you actually read it, it's like, oh my goodness, that's horrifying. We need to be careful. Well, on the other side, there's a whole, whole lot of data about uh, that, that you can have children who are overwhelmed by a traumatic experience and they block it out in some way or another and it's completely gone for five or 10 or 15 or 27 or 32 years and it comes back. I'll just touch on some of those things. Like, you know, myself and many colleagues I know well, who that happens in your office and a person who you're working with, I mean, there's all kinds of clues of trauma. They have post-traumatic stress disorder. There's the, the whole range of clinical indicators that says some kind of significant trauma happened to this person, triggers their reactions or overreactions. There's just their, their dreams, all kinds of aspects of their life, panic attacks. Um, and then either before they come to you, like I said, they watch a movie, they talk, they're talking to a friend, they just start having dreams, whatever. Or while you're just working with them, okay, Jesus, let's focus on the anxiety and ask, what's that about, Lord? The person says, well, I'm just getting this image of fill in the blank and my cousin or whatever. And, and if you make, you can carefully avoid any suggestion regarding any detail. You just coach the person to focus on their symptoms, what they had when they walked in the door. You say, okay, well, this is what you, these are the things that you said were present when you walked in the door. I want you to focus on those and we're going to ask Jesus for guidance. And you sit there and watch as they start remem remembering all these details that you, you, never, you didn't know and you didn't suggest, and they unfold. And in some cases, you can then go get corroborating information. You go tell, tell the person, well, talk to your cousins and your sisters. You come back, oh, I talked to 14 of my, my sisters and 14 of my cousins, and every single female sibling and cousin in my family described being lusted in the same way by the same guy. Oh, that's an interesting data point. Or things like that. And, you know, it's not proof to somebody else, but to me, having seen that happen over and over again and having colleagues with, with similar experiences, that's a big data point for me. And then in the essay, it documents there's a whole bunch of, out of the 150 that are going to be in the book, I pulled out the 20 that are the clearest. Like examples where um, you have uh, medical records of, you know, carefully documented, I mean, it's all so well documented that somebody went to jail for it. When the, when the young lady was 10 years old or eight years old or whatever, and you know, this abuse was uncovered, and there's medical exams and photographs and testimony and forensic evidence, and it's all documented, it's all in the records. And then there's 15 years of her life where she and everybody around her says, oh yeah, that she had no memory of any of this, it all went somewhere. And then 15 or 10 or 25 or 32 years later, it comes back 
And what she remembers, you know, and everybody, she and her therapist and everybody agree, oh, there was all these years where she didn't remember any of this. But here it came back and whatever, you know, she had a child and that little girl got to her same age and looked just like she did, or fill in the blank of some activating stimuli. And then she, re she describes remembering all this stuff, and then they discover, oh my goodness, look at all these medical records that exactly match everything she describes. So that kind of, I mean, there's piles of that kind of evidence that to me say, anybody who's being honest and looks at that would say, yes, sometimes you can have a horrible thing happen, it's totally buried in some way or another, and years later it can come back. So, that chunk, and I'm going to touch on suggestion and counterfeit Jesus as the last piece. So, all of that package, which is sort of just a spontaneous with no notes, short run on it, summarizing the, the big picture. So, one piece there is don't dismiss somebody who is possibly recovering childhood trauma. Don't, um, there's books written by PhDs who are very smart who claim that that whole phenomenon is all made up. I think that's misguided. I think they've missed half the picture. It's really, really important to be open to the possibility that somebody really can have trauma that was buried in some way. And you're in your prayer session, they, they come in saying, well, no, I, I, I didn't have any kind of trauma. I can't really remember much of my childhood, but no, it was fine. They focus on their panic attacks. You ask them, okay, Jesus, focus on Jesus, ask them for guidance. And then all this content comes forward. Don't dismiss that because somebody told you it doesn't happen and it's a false memory. Okay, one great big point. And then the mirror point is, don't suggest details about possible trauma. You can say, focus on that anxiety and we'll ask Jesus for guidance or, or whatever else they come in with. You know, they have this kind of triggered reaction, but you start with what they come bring in, what they come in with, you coach them to ask Jesus for guidance and you listen to what they describe but you don't suggest details about traumatic content. We don't want to do the punch, the spilled punch on the ant's wedding dress. You, and even, even if you're mostly right, but you just get the perpetrator wrong, you destroy some innocent person's family, right? So don't dismiss the possibility that someone can recover real trauma and don't suggest details about possible traumatic events. And those two points right there is like the summary of the whole essay and the whole book. But for folks who need convincing, like part of why you're getting this, I mean, most of you probably already get both those points, but I'm sure you will run into people on one side or the other that will need a little bit more convincing, in which case you go pull, like you can start with that 20 page essay, which has 27 footnotes in it and summarizes the research pieces and every one of them has a footnote where you can go to if you want to read the whole article. So it's just a little quick summary of a resource if you find people on either side that need, that, that um, need more help to, to, to really believe it. Okay, that was probably 18 minutes or 22 or whatever, but that's the, that was a crash course on all of that. Yeah, it, just helping us know the lines. And I think, I think when you say, look at the risk and look at the benefits. So yes, we are suggesting. When we say, Jesus has never left you or forsaken you, where is he? That is a suggestion. It happens to be reality. Right. Um, that's true. Yes. Um, but we are doing some suggestion. Yep. And I just want you to hear Dr. Carl's thorough risk and, and benefit. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so you're wiser. Yeah, and you can you can un, you can unapologetically use that tool. Right. Recognize, yes, there is it is suggestive, but it's a reasonable risk. We can address it. Acknowledging that reality, I think it's worth using it anyway. Don't and get defensive. Don't have to get defensive. You just say, yeah, right. Yeah, but people might have an allergic reaction to penicillin. Yes, that's correct. And that's why we have the little epi the epinephrine pin right here, because one out of a thousand or whatever it is, you know, there are people who have an allergic reaction. I think if we don't give it to your child, there's a 50% chance he's going to die of measles or whatever. Uh, well, actually, that's a virus. It doesn't respond to penicillin. My bad for the medical people out there. But in any case, yeah, you, just, you don't get defensive. You just say... Good concern, I'm glad you asked that question. Here's what we have to do, here's how we can respond to that. With that additional information, do you still wanna go ahead? Oh, right, thank you. And they'll feel less anxious, they can recognize that you actually know what you're doing, they'll feel safer in your care, and you all say, yeah, right. I'm glad I asked that question, that was a valid concern, there's a good answer for it, and now we can go forward feeling even more confident. Mm 